Hi, it's Gadget UK here again. This time we're back with a Neo Geo. Nothing wrong with this, I don't think. We will, uh, well, we'll find out <laughs> when we start to test it. You can see it's just arrived. I've uh, pulled the top off here just to have an inspection of the board. Uh, the first observation is the screws are a bit rusted. Well, some of them are, can you see? Tops of them, and they're all different lengths <laughs> completely. You've got two that are the same there. Oh, they're not even the same, actually. Those two are. But then we've got a short one and a long one, so I'm going to probably swap those screws out as well. Uh, but I thought it'd just be interesting to have a look at this 1C here. You can see in the middle there, Neo-MVH-MV1C. So this was, as far as I know, the final MVS uh, revision. And it's amazing to see how small it is. It's like the consolidated. You know, you've seen all the Neo Geo repairs on my channel. I've covered quite a lot of different boards. Um, now it's only a single slot, but the form factor here is tiny. It is absolutely tiny. Being able to reduce all of the crazy amount of chips you get on some of those other uh, boards, and I'll stick some photos up of the larger boards here while I'm waffling. But to be able to reduce to what is effectively, you know, three main chips and a CPU, and then you've obviously got a ROM down here, so the 74 series here, uh, the clock chip I think, and 74 series here. RAM and then flip it over and we've just got some different types of RAM here and again some buffers. There's, there's literally nothing on this board, it's incredible that they were able to reduce the, the chips into, you know, mostly this large ASIC here. And from what I understand that's the main thing that fails on these, if you get a uh, 1C and it's got a fault, it's going to be this chip, I think the controller inputs run through here, it's obviously got the entire back plane of the system, you know, the all of the address decoding, all of the stuff to the graphics, uh, you know, things like the, the B1 and the LSPC, all merged into there. Um, there is one chip over here, which I think is primarily for dip switches and stuff, but I think maybe some other connectivity, oh, this because a lot of connections around that, some other connectivity goes around that as well. So this information has probably come from Vertec on the Neo Geo developer wiki. You can see, actually, it does the address decoding, uh, coin IO system register and weight cycle generator. CPU. And this chip here, I think, is primarily the uh, encapsulation of all the sound stuff. It's a YSA2, is it? I think it is. Yeah, so it's got the Yamaha, the YM2610, the Z80, the RAM. There is no SM1. It doesn't have the ROM there for testing the Z80. At least I don't think it does. I'm pretty sure if you stick a stock BIOS into one of these or you put UniBIOS onto it, you'll get a Z80 error if you enable the test mode because it thinks, you know, it tries to do the test there, you know, if you've got a normal ROM, and it will fail. But, uh, yeah, so that's interesting. Uh, some test points up here around that I see. Now, I know, because I was looking at the, the specs for this in relation to something else, which I'll talk about in a minute, uh, the test points here, someone's actually scoped these when it's sat at the crosshatch, so that's useful. You could uh, use the, the signals there to, you know, work out whether your board's behaving normally at the crosshatch. So one thing that makes the 1C desirable is the form factor, you know, it's really small here, it's quite easy to consoleize compared to some of the other boards, and the fact that the slot is upright here, you know, so you, if you had a plastic shell, you could literally just cut a hole here for the slot, and you've got, you know, a little consoleized uh, MVS. And that's another reason why this board is popular with the companies that make sort of, uh, you know, professional consoleized MVSs. Things like the, I think there's an analog one, isn't there? There's a few others. There was a nice one in like an oak kind of like wooden shell. I think that's the analog one, isn't it? Or one of the ones, they might have a few different ones, I don't know. But yeah, they tend to go with the 1C. So we've got battery here, I'll check that in a minute, but it's not the type that leaks, I don't think. It looks a bit corroded though, you can see that, it's uh, greeny on both sides, so it's going to need cleaning up no matter what. The crystal down here, can you see it's black? Yeah, so I'm going to clean that with a fiberglass pen. And the two solder points look absolutely terrible where that crystal joins. Um, but other than that, you know, and the connector here, the jammer connector looking a bit dirty, um, there's nothing really wrong with this. It doesn't look too bad at all. Very few capacitors on this. We've got one up here, three here, four, five, six, seven, eight. Yeah, so nine, uh, there's one up there, ten. Ten or so capacitors on this, not very many at all. The solder points around the main ASIC there look all right. But again, I'll, you know, give it a clean. I'll go around this with uh, cotton buds and IPA and stuff. Around the CPU there is looking good, I think. And around the chip up there, again, it looks fine. It's in uh, very good condition, really. So you've got the main audio amp here, and I think that's the pot, is it? Yeah, 
there you go so you can adjust the volume level there I'm not sure if this board outputs mono as default you might have to do like a DAC mod to it or something I'm thinking that could be the DAC there actually and it might be a mono mono one um, because there's very few pins on that I could be wrong it could just be an op amp or something um, and then you've got the connector here I think that's for the um, credit display isn't it I'm pretty sure it is uh, there's nothing else to it really <laughs> there's nothing else to say but well, I've got a fuse here that's an inclusion that you don't get on a lot of the uh, MVS boards. The 1B may have a fuse. I can't quite remember now. But anyway, yeah, they've added a fuse on there. So that's uh, that's quite a nice uh, inclusion. So I got this from AliExpress, actually. I was uh, pleasantly surprised that it arrived and it works. Well, I think it works. Even the shell is not too bad. You know, it's a bit dirty here, you can see. So, uh, yeah, I'll get that into the sink and give it a scrub. But uh, it seems all right. It's had a bit of a knock here. If you look at this side, you can see it's nice and straight but this side is kind of bent in um, now that's the sort of thing that um, could be just due to the way it was mounted in the chassis you know someone sort of bent this to screw it in rather than straightening it up so you could just heat that with a little bit hot air I might just try that I don't know 200 degrees or something and just try and straighten it a little bit you don't want to go too hot you'll melt it totally or it'll burn it but uh, yeah if you get the, it's ABS it's ABS but if you get the temperature low enough there but high enough so that you can you know just heat here Heat here and then just gently pull it like that, hold it in place, it should uh, reform itself. So I'll give the jammer connector a clean first of all I think. It does look like it's been cleaned perhaps but there's some black bits on there and it's a little, little bit coppery there, can you see that? So yeah it's been cleaned already. flip it over. I'll wipe over it with some uh, deoxy in a minute as well. I mean they're not gold plated or anything these, they are solder coated so you don't really need to use deoxy to be honest. Let's just wipe over that with a bit of IPA there so yeah it's not much better uh, and there is a little bit of copper on the edge there actually so yeah it could probably benefit from uh, being re-coated with some fresh solder perhaps. Anyway, that's clean and for testing, I think. The next thing I want to do is just clean the top of that crystal because as you can see, it's black. So let's just have a little scrub there. Look at that, it's coming straight off. I think I'm gonna go around that with some vinegar, actually, this this area here. I'll just go around these as well. But if the contacts don't look any better, I might uh, just reflow the, the two points on that crystal. Anyway, that's uh, that's a lot better, I think. Let's just have a clean around that now with a cotton bud and see. Yeah, look at all the dirt coming off that. Yeah, that's looking a lot better. You can see it was pretty dirty there, though. Let's we'll have a clean on top of the dip switches there, because this, uh, yeah, look, dirt again. It's just some dirt. We're going to need to set one of those dip switches in a minute just to get into the uh, you know the settings. There's one you can set, I forget which one it is now, for the RAM is it, dip switch 8, and it will test the uh, work RAM. It will also clear the B RAM at the same time when you do that. I'll have a clean under there. Uh, and then we'll just uh, clean that battery up actually and measure it. It's still looking a little bit dirty on top of that one. And of course we could just uh, clean the tops and underneath of those uh, dip switches as well there. Perhaps get some contact cleaner or deoxy or something in there in a sec. Yeah, that's looking pretty good now. Whilst I'm here, I'm going to go over the board with cotton buds anyway, but we'll we'll just do this. We'll clean this connector up here, just see if we can get rid of the marks and things off that. Yeah, there you go. It's coming up a lot better. The middle of the board is pretty clean actually, but what I will do is just go gently with IPA over the contacts here and then use the dry end. Because just sometimes you can get, you know, just a little bit of uh, something starting there and uh, just giving a wipe over it so you can see it, you know, will reveal uh, under magnification whether there's uh, any corrosion starting. That one B board you saw, stickling cup top left. That was, some of the pins on that were awful. Uh, I looked at that board recently, so I was using it to test the uh, Xeno Crisis, which is what I'm going to use this for. That was why I purchased this, actually. I've been meaning to get a 1C for a long while, but it just sort of 
prompted things because there was a, an issue on a 1C out there. So I said to the guys at Bitmap Bureau, I'll get a 1C myself and I'll, I'll have a bit of a test just to make sure there's nothing that uh, you've missed, you know, in terms of compatibility with a 1C. And there isn't, as you'll see, it works perfectly with uh, the 1C here. The other thing is with the 1C, because there's, there's only these four main chips here and then you know a few bits of seven four stuff there's so little on there i'd be amazed if it was you know the game didn't work with one particular mv1c but then work with all the others that's very unlikely you're more likely to find that sort of thing on the other boards the, the ones with the you know a lot more chips that's where you might get variance in some of the seven four series stuff um depending on you know where it was manufactured whether it's been repaired whether the right parts were put back on etc there's a lot less on these to go wrong, if you think about it, because there's uh, so few chips. Hopefully it still works after doing this. It did work when I first got it before I you know, took the lid off here. So I tried a bit of WD-40 here, and uh, just do a bit of that actually. Yeah, that one's pretty clean. Just looks a bit dark, this one was the rusted one. It still is actually. Yeah, you can see the rust coming off there, look. So I'll clean this shell up afterwards, so we'll be taking this back out again in a minute. So I think the way you've got to put this back together, so you've got to slide the board into the gap here. And it's quite tight, because can you see that heat sink there catching? This is the problem. So maybe I do it the other way around. Yeah, we do it the other way around, I'm doing it backwards here. So slide it in the cart slot first, like this here, I think. God, that's tight. Uh, and then all the way through, I think, like that, that's it. There's no screws at that point there, or that point there. It just sits on top of there, doesn't it? But anyway, it will fit like that. Well, I thought that was going to be easy to get back in, but it turned out to be an absolute pain, actually. Um, yeah, these screws are different lengths, aren't they? Oh, flipping egg. Yeah, you can see if you just move the thing when you're trying to get the screws aligned, if you're not careful, you can have it slide right out like that. There you go. And then it's really hard to get back into position again. No, it's just right that. That's just right. So I had this on for a couple of hours earlier, so the battery should be charged. Now, I really should have done this when I had the lid off, but anyway, let's just put the meter probe on that side there, yeah? And then put the other probe on the inside. You can see that's two volts. Now bear in mind, it's only been on for two hours or something. Um, I think it's still charging up. That should go up to around three volts, I think. So yeah, I'll report back later when we've played it a bit more. But anyway, let's connect it up and see if it works again. So this is my cheap Jammer Supergun. Uh, it says on there, Arcade Supergun Mark IV. It's about 15, 20 quid. You find they're a bit more now, like 30 odd pounds, but you can buy them on AliExpress and you sometimes now they've got a DIN on the back so you could use like a Mega Drive video cable or a Saturn video cable. You get joystick ports on there for the 15 pin D types, uh, you know, that Neo Geo uses. And obviously a SCART connector in this case and a connector for an ATX power connection. So I can use a PC for your power supply, you know, ATX plug that in this has got a button on here for adding credits that button sticks though look it's annoying that and then you just uh, stick it onto the jammer edge here this way up you can see actually there's a divider there so this is how this particular one mounts and it just sort of sits there like that and then I can switch the ATX power supply on and as you can see we get a cross hatch so that does seem to be working still that's good the only thing is that battery two volts after an hour or so Mm, I'd expect it to be higher, but you know what? It could have been really, really low. It could have been like, you know, flat, totally. So uh, after another hour or two, we'll measure it again. If it's around the three volt mark, I won't be bothering swapping it. But uh, yeah, if it's not, then I will swap it. So the next thing I'm going to do is switch it off. I'm going to set one of the dip switches. I forget which one it is now. In fact, I don't think we need to do that. I think you can press something here, yeah, select look. And so there you go, you get the color blocks. Now I really like this BIOS. This one's uh, a greater version, it's version 6, I think the one I looked at on the 1B was version 5, but there's just something about this version of BIOS that I really like. It's the presentation of it, I think, so you've got the RGB test there, press 1P start for the next screen, uh, and then you can see I can move these around here. Now we've got an issue there, that might indicate as the fault, can you see that? Dip 1 is shown as being set, and I don't think it is, I don't think it's set. 
So there could be a fault with this. So anyway, A, B, C, D, select start. Uh, let's just go back around. A, B, C, if you hold all those down at the same time, it clears the B RAM. So yeah, the dating time's not set correct there. I'm not interested in that just now. Let's just go around again. What I want to do at this point is unplug the controller, plug the controller into the other connection. So this is for player two. And I want to test the inputs for player two actually. So left, right, up, down, A, B, C, D. Select start. Yeah, so those inputs are all working as you can see. Yeah. It's just that dip switch. Now let me get a screwdriver. I'm just going to just toggle dip switch one in case it's just a bit dirty perhaps. Ah, dip switch one is down. I must have knocked it. There we go. Back up. Hey. So we can test each of those now. Look, this is the other benefit with this test. So we'll do them all. Two, three, four, five, six. I can't count, can I? Seven and eight. It's hard because I'm doing it at a weird angle here. Let's just flip them all back up. Yeah, so it's fine. It works perfectly in terms of the control inputs. And as I say, if you pick up a 1C, that is something you need to do. You need to test that because it is a common fault with 1Cs for that to be a, you know, a point of failure. Right, so let's switch that off and I'll get a cart in. So the first thing I'm going to test it with here is uh, Gangan. -Gan. Uh, you can see this, it's a really nice uh, collectible car, this. It's one of the white ones, SNKG, you see that? This was from the rental side of SNK. They set up a rental division and rented uh, you know, games and systems out to hotels, and hotels would rent them to the customers. Um, yeah, so the arrow is here, you can't quite see it, and there's an arrow there. Normally these are painted white, but yeah, you get the arrow towards the arrow. So it's going to go that way around, just carefully, this is the thing, trying to line it. There we go. And switch it on. Excellent. And that seems to be working. So let's stick a credit in. And it's star. Yeah, that's looking and sounding okay. Bear in mind, I'm just testing at this point with one speaker connected. It's not coming from the TV, the sound. One of the things with ADK games, you've got this like fast hit, slow hit system, which I never really got on with. What I mean by that is if you tap A, you do a quick punch, if you hold A, you do a, you know, a hard punch, like soft and hard hits, depending on how long you press the button. Yeah, it's not going to sound quite the same because we do only have the one speaker connected. Let me just see if I can wire this up to the TV actually. Right, so I have sound come through the TV now. But you know what, I think it's mono. Actually, I think these output mono. I think you would need to do a DAC mod to one of these if you wanted stereo output on it. That's certainly how it sounds to me and I've inspected the jammer. I've got it switched, you know, the super gun. I've got it set into the stereo position. But yeah, that sounds mono. Let's, uh, let's just try it now with Xeno Crisis. Yeah, that's definitely mono. Without a doubt. So it charged up to about three volts yesterday and overnight, as you'll see, it, well, it had gone to zero. It's just been on for an hour and you can see we've got about 1.7 volts there, but it's going down. 10 minutes ago that was at 2 volts, so that battery does need replacing. Now, trying to find a bit of replacement is quite hard these days, because they don't make uh, you know lithium-ion rechargeables that physical size. This is a little bit smaller. I think that's like 80 milliamp hour, this is uh, 40. But it will you know hold the power there for uh, a number of weeks or months when it's uh, not powered on, so that's all we need really. Um, positive is on this side, so I am going to solder this on there. Uh, measured this, it's 4 volts, so I've had this years, quite quite a few of them, we've got 
10 or so of these lithium ion rechargeables um, of course the thing we've lacking here is these little supports now I do have somewhere some upright CR2032 holders I can't find them at all so I figure I'm just going to solder this on actually it is a rechargeable one um, it will mean just scratching I'll show you that you can you can actually solder tabs onto these it's there is a risk of fire when you're actually doing it at the point you're doing it you know it could just get really hot and explode or whatever but this is very unlikely actually yeah that's better it's giving it time to soak through because it's quite a large trace that yeah you can see I've soldered that one okay again this one's going to take some time I think I might need to use the second iron, which could be a challenge when I'm holding this flap up here. Look, I don't want to let go of that, whatever I do. Yeah, so that's struggling to melt. Yeah, there we go. So it's just the centre tab now. Well, ignore what I'm saying. The reason it fell over like that is because the centre tab had come out. Look, it's off. It's off. Obviously I can desolder these further, in fact we could do that now, I could just desolder those a little bit further from the top side here. And I'm going to use the iron as well here just to get a little bit of extra heat so that it sucks it up pretty easily. There you go. So the next thing I want to do is try and uh, get these off here off I can. Doesn't matter if we don't get the whole thing, um, but certainly the centre one here I'd like to try and get right up here like this and just see if we can prise it off yeah like that there we go because what I can do then you see is straighten this up like this there's a spot welded on you know like arc welded effectively I think or cold what do they call it cold welding or something I think something like that yeah, so that's one. We'll clean this uh, contact up here. It's a little bit dirty. Well, that will go back on. And uh, yeah, this side might be a lot harder. Yeah, it's not too bad, actually. There are a few little ripples and things in there. Yeah, but actually, you can see that's not bad. So, yeah, that can go in the bin. Well, recycling. So the positive side is the one that wants the two. So we just need to uh, mount this something like that. So how do you solder onto something that doesn't have solder contacts like this? Yeah, and it's just a case of you know put put that on there like that so we can get that in approximately the right position. Um, and then we know it's just around this plus here actually. So if I just scratch around that, oh, hang on, with something sharp all different angles and orientations so I'm just soldering under the magnifier here uh, you can see I managed to get a blob of solder into the center of it there um, but I'm using the magnifier just to protect me just in case it does decide to explode it's unlikely but it could do yeah as I say don't do as I do but this is what I do and uh, yeah we just need to overlap that on there like that Let's just try and straighten that a bit. So that's one side on. Just let that cool before we do any more soldering. So that's had a few minutes there to cool down. I'm just going to clean around that with some IPA. So yeah, the, the blob is a little bit blobby. Oh, it's come off, look. Yeah, so it didn't work on this occasion. Coincidentally, whilst editing, I have just seen my mate Vince use the tool I'm about to show you here on eBay. You can buy these pretty cheap. Uh, yeah, so check out the link to Vince's video. Right, so the battery holders have arrived. You can see he's going to be able to solder those three pins on. It's going to stand upright, just like the original battery did, and then we can get a rechargeable cell in there. Oh, joy. Now the holes don't line up. I thought this was going to be really straightforward. I mean, in theory, I could literally drill a hole through there, actually, because uh, those two pins are short to each other, but can you see there's a rail that goes all the way along there? So you could drill through in order to mount that. Hmm. I'll have a think about it, I'll see which, uh, what other way I can come up with the mounting that. Right, I fitted it on there between uh, the point here and the middle point. So it's pointing straight upwards, but obviously it's, it's uh, an angle. Should be all right though. I think it should fit with inside the uh, lid there. Bear in mind this battery is uh, not quite got the same capacity. 
Yeah, it's an LAR2032. So I just need to work out which way that round that goes. Now, of course, I could have the socket the wrong way, but I don't think so because we've gone off the you know the common pin where it should be. Um, and I trimmed the pin off the side, by the way, just so it's not hanging down. It's not going to touch the board. Uh, let's just see where ground is. So I think ground is one of these edge connections here, isn't it? Let's just uh, check 274 series. Yeah, so that's ground. So I'm guessing... Yeah, the single point on its own is ground there. This side is ground. Which means it's going to go that way around. Yeah, that's correct. So if I just uh, push that in... Oh, Yeah, that's one consequence. Is obviously, you could break the solder points there. But you can see we've got quite a big beady solder point there. So let's just uh, shrink that down just a, a smidge. It's probably a consequence of adding solder from the other side a minute ago. There we go, that's a bit better. That should be okay now, so that should uh, charge and hold charge. So I'll give that a test. So I was going to use that LIR. Um, there's a short, a dead short. <laughs> this has failed. And I tested the same with another one. Anyway, I found a Maxell one. Um, yeah, again, it's a rechargeable. So, uh, and it's in the right way. And actually, I can show you if we just measure on voltage here, put it on volts DC. So you can see the meter there. If I measure from ground on the jammer edge to the up leftmost pin there on the RAM, you can see 2.7 ish volts roughly. So that's working. Actually, that's powering the SRAM at the moment. So I'll just carefully reassemble this and go and try it. So let's measure the battery contacts there. It's been off overnight 2.46 volts. So yeah, it's not um, going to hold masses of charge for you know very long periods of time, but that's not too bad. It will hold a charge uh, when it's not being used. Right, so that's been on for a few hours. It should be charged up now. Switch it off. I don't think that battery's charging. I'm starting to suspect it's not a rechargeable battery, being sold as a rechargeable battery. So a meter on current at DC. Uh, you have to change the probe, the positive, from uh, voltage to, well, we're going to be over 300 milliamps, so we're going to need to go into the 10 amps thing here. This is like a short now. So if you me tried measuring voltage, you will short out your supply. I don't generally show measuring current, so I guess this is uh, useful. If you've never measured current, you don't know how to do it, this is how you can do it when you've got a fuse like this. We can literally just uh, hang on, <laughs> try and precariously balance everything here, like that. And I'm just going to use the probes, hold the probes onto the two contacts here. Being careful not to slip because you could feed the power somewhere you don't want it to. So anyway, I'm going to yeah. So I'm going to hold them on there like that. So if I switch the power supply on, got no power. So as I make a contact there, you can see there 0.7 of an amp it's booting up. It's not booting now. Let's put the fuse back in. Yeah, now it's booting. What is going on? It could be that the um, holder is dirty. I'll try and show you on the screen what's actually happening. But as I hold these probes, uh, like I say, in two different places here on the fuse, but you see we've not got a maximised surface area. It's, it's quite a limited surface area on the probes. Right, hang on. Holding them in position, right, really switching the power on. Watch. It's not booting. Getting a weird colour. Now it's booting. No, it's not. It's frozen. So, yeah, I think it's about, you know, one side of the fuse holder is touching there and onto that point. There's not enough surface area here for the, you know, probably more than one amp it actually needs to pull. So, my meter is showing 0.7 uh, of an amp. I'm darn sure it's more than 0.7 of an amp actually. It could also be that we're getting some voltage drop from the ATX uh, here as well. Um, and the length of the leads, look, this is the thing. So I mean, I'll try it one more time here for good measure. Yeah, it's not booting. Now if these probes touch each other, it's not a problem, but if you're short to uh, the ROM, Bad things would happen. No, it's not booting. It's going to be the length of the wires there, actually. 
and the size of the probes. So yeah, if you wanted to measure something like that, you probably need like some really short probes, you know, I don't know, something that goes like that long, and then you won't get as much uh, voltage drop. Uh, yeah, and fine probes like that, not the best thing for measuring when you're touching the, the points on a fuse holder there. But yeah, anyway, that was showing like 0.7 of an amp. So this uses less power, and you may expect that because there's a lot less chips on there, than um, the older one slots. Right, try it again with the fuse in. Yeah, it works straight away. Right, so ages later, a few things. So let's just uh, clean the underside of that because I don't think I cleaned them with that. Yeah, it's a bit dirty though, isn't it? So, I mean, I could just wash this thing in the uh, sink here. But anyway, it's come out pretty clean. You know, there's the odd bit of dust and stuff on this not too bad. Um, in terms of yeah, getting the board in there, I didn't really explain very well before, in fact there's a bit more, a bit more dirt there. So we'll try and heat that in a minute with some hot air. Uh, but yeah, the way to get the board in is, because of this heat sink here, it catches. Uh, so obviously, you know, you want it to go that way. If you try and slide it in here, the heat sink gets caught. If you try and slide it in that way, the heat sink gets caught. You've got to go in, down an angle, like that. Yeah, get the back in, and then slide it to the front that simple but obviously you're then going to flip it upside down and get the screws uh, into the holes that way so in terms of the battery mod this is probably the bodgiest <laughs> video I have ever done in the sense that if you fit uh, a rich you know a cell here a rechargeable one as I did then you're relying on the charge circuit here which is designed for the original battery which is probably nickel metal hydride or NICAD as I mentioned in annotations earlier on over on Jammer Nation X, there'll be a link down below, there's a, a full mod guide to these boards, including you know, the battery mod here, but also you can add a reset switch, you've got the uh, stereo mod you can do, you can tap off the stereo, uh, out, I think that's the DAC, out of that little chip there, that could actually be an op-amp, I'm not sure, out of that chip there, um, and I'll talk about that again in a minute, and I think as part of the audio mod there, you can remove this amplifier, because you're no longer amplifying the mono sound out, and it gives you a bit more space and stuff, and then you can get the board uh, in and out a lot easier as well, and it covers stuff to with the controller inputs and stuff there so you could fully consoleize a 1c like that so yeah check out the links down below to Chamination x so coming back to the the guide over there in terms of the battery mod he's put a little excerpt of the schematic i'm not going to share that with you i'll put a link to that you can go and have a look at it it's worth checking out his website but there are two diodes and a resistor you can leave the resistor on there because once you remove the two diodes the battery here is no longer getting a charge from the board yeah and the resistor just one end of it is floating at that point so it's kind of an optional thing to remove the resistor but it's d5 uh, d6 and I think there's a resistor there, I forget the part on the bar, stick the resistor and the, the two diodes up there in an annotation. So you can remove those and then just use a standard button cell. Uh, and I may do that. Um, this does work with a rechargeable lithium ion here, but I would say at best I get about a week's charge on it. It's, you know, it's not very, um, the, you know, it's, the, the, the issue is the charge circuit, as I say, is not designed for lithium ion. That is the, the issue, I think, there. Um, and, and the original battery would have been at higher capacitance as well. But I guess the same issue with the rechargeable lithium ion you're going to have with a standard CR2032. Maybe not, actually. Those hold a bit more capacity, I think. Uh, anyway, so there's a few different options there. I'm just going to get a rechargeable back in there. We'll just charge this up now. But I've took the board back out just to give it a final clean. You can see there's a bit of, uh, like contamination around here so I'm just going to have a toothbrush around this board. I'll zoom in on the uh, main three chips here so you can uh, see the part numbers for those and yeah I'll talk a little bit. Yeah, Other points of interest you've got a main 24 MHz crystal there that gets divided down presumed in this because this is primarily the sound I see uh, and I said I was going to come back to the stereo stuff. The interesting thing is in Xeno Crisis one of the issues the guys had is they found the stereo was flipped on the 1C. Uh, so they've put a fix into the you know the latest builds of uh, Xeno Crisis. You can get your car updated if you've got an older one. But looking at on Jamination X, the stereo guide talks about this chip here, the data sheet having the left and the right channels around the wrong way. And that might be the issue, but there could also be another issue in the sense that um, on internally to this, you know, it's got a YM2610 implementation 
one there and uh, apparently they did something with one of the sound you know where you've got stereo it might be the uh, PCM stuff I think the channels are flipped there so not sure whether there's two lots of flipping going on or whether it's this that's the reason for the problem with Xeno crisis and you know anyway uh, that's just a bit of interesting information all the other MVS boards the left and right you know separation is correct uh, you know the stereo is, is correct on the other boards you can see here on the developer wiki the pinout for that sound chip there and it does the controller inputs and outputs as well so yeah a, a bit of a correction earlier on this point of the larger quad flat pack it's the smaller quad flat pack that handles the inputs by the looks of things uh, and you can see the test points there, again uh, cutting back to the uh, developer wiki, thanks to Furtech and all the people that manage that wiki. You can see you can actually uh, you could scope those test pads and uh, make sure you get in the uh, correct signals there. Again on the Neo Geo developer wiki, just looking at the stuff that's been contributed by Furtech here, you've got a full pinout for this chip here, but it confirms what I was saying about the RAM, so yeah, it's like the chip on the, the MV1B, it contains the pallet RAM and the fast VRAM. And the interesting thing that caught me by surprise, scrolling down, but it's confirmed something I've just seen on the board, it uses 3.3 volts. And I'll just put a freeze frame here and just point out where I think the 3.3 volt regulation is. Yeah, so it's 3.3 volt, but it's obviously got 5 volt on its uh, IO pins, according to Furto, which makes sense. And the final point before I just clean this up and uh, do a final test is because you've got RAM built into uh, these things, you know, this has got the uh, sound RAM, this has got some of the graphics RAM, I think, the, the two of the different types, I think, because you've got the, the B RAM here, yeah, that's your backup RAM, 64K, I think, and then uh, work RAM is going to be one of these, presumed that, because that is right underneath the, C, uh, the CPU, PLCC. 68,000 there. It runs at 12 megahertz, doesn't it? We've got some 74 series, 74 series. So yeah, there's a bit of 74 series stuff you could swap out if you had some sort of issue. And then we've got two chips here that sit bang underneath the large chip here. So this is going to be the slow VRAM, I think. Um, you know, so you, on other MVS you get the quite long chips don't you that are the fast ones it's at 5814 or something like that there's like 35 nanoseconds aren't they so those are going to be built into this yeah uh, and the pallet ram yeah yeah the part numbers on that are identical to this so yeah it's the same sort of thing as i think the mgat had the fast um, v ram built in didn't it so yeah you could over time get a problem with that ram you're knackered you can't do anything about it because it's internal Nevertheless, it is impressive that they managed to reduce from, I don't know, 30, 40, 50 or more chips down to this really limited implementation here that just fits on a tiny little PCB. Fuse, by the way, is 5 amp. Yeah, it's marked there, 125 volts, 5 amp. Which is a bit high rated, really, because you tend to find uh, these things don't use anywhere near that. You know, uh, any of the MVS one slots I've tested with a, a 161 in one cart, you draw in about one and a half amp. I mean, you could get quite a high um, surge when you first switch it on, but nevertheless, five amps is crazy high in my, in my mind. If I, I'd be tempted to take that out and put a two amp fuse in it. I might actually do that in a minute, put a two amp fuse in it. But then again, it depends on the amplifier level. You know, when it's in a cabinet, you get that quite loud. Maybe it does draw more than I'm expecting. So the other thing to consider is if you're charging a lithium-ion rechargeable like I am here, it could explode. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Because you've not got the charge circuit right there. Yeah, bad things could happen. But I'll be honest, I've never had a problem. And I think actually I, I put a rechargeable like that into my Dreamcast and I've used it a lot. And uh, never had a problem and it holds the charge really well. But perhaps not as well, uh, you know, it doesn't hold as much power as a fixed, you know, a standard CR2032 that's, you know, disposable rather than rechargeable. A one-shot thing, you know, one-time thing. Uh, and if you saw previous videos on the 1B, I'll stick a, a link uh, above and in the description, etc. You can, you know, obviously do a BIOS mod, remove the, the ROM here and then connect the output enable and the chip selector or something to a PCB. And I designed one of those for the 1B, so it's worth having a look at that video. Uh, at some point I may make that uh, open source, but there are other, you know, adapters you can get that go from a, you know, dip, a larger dip chip to um, the 68K uh, PLCC socket there. Because I don't think there are any uh, 
replacement chips that fit in this footprint. That's the problem. We might do that in another video. Because then you can get, you know, a diagnostics bias onto it or a unibars. If you're wondering what a unibars is, if you're new to the channel, a unibars is like an updated modern BIOS created by Rizula that allows uh, you to do a number of things. It allows cheats for games, it allows you to change the region, it allows you to switch the system into AES or MVS mode and it's got diagnostics and things built in, it's, it's really cool. Again there'll be a link to the Unibars website down below. Anyway I'm just going to just dry up around here. I'm just testing it with the 161 in here. I've uh, got headphones connected up. Yeah, it's not a good idea because it's using the amplified audio. And bear in mind it's mono, we need to do a stereo mod. But yeah, setting that to potentiometer right down there. And there may be a resistor or something that uh, limits here, but the volume level is just right now. It's like double dragon. And if I uh, bring these near, you might be able to hear if I can find the mic. Yeah, that's working. Yeah, so just measuring battery contacts here, uh, or the contact. So I'm measuring between ground on the jammer edge, which is the far left pin. Be careful not to short the supply out here. A positive 3.4 volts look. So, yeah, this is the thing. This is why you can get away approximately being able to charge a lithium ion. Because those, yeah, you'd probably find it's just over 3 volts, 3.5 volts, 3.4 volts. Some charges maybe it's 3.7 volts. But you see, it's current controlled, you know, over and the, 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 the current changes over time in order to optimally charge a lithium ion rechargeable. And something really obvious that you may not know another benefit of a Unibars, if I fit one on here, is don't need to use the credit button. Yeah, so you press this and it adds a credit to the game. And then obviously, you know, I showed you earlier just in a little window up the top right there, the LED uh, counter uh, thing. So yeah, that would increment and show you how many credits you've got. Yeah, so if you use a Unibars, you can just hit the select button. Uh, and that's not going to work here now, so I'll show you. This game start, I can hear the sound. Yeah, and if it's select, it doesn't do anything. If I had a Unibars now, I could just press the select button and the credits would increment. Uh, anyway, press that coin insert button on the jammer. And of course, that's just a, a button that goes to the jammer edge. So, you know, it's just one of the other additional inputs. So you could, if you consoleize one of these, put your own coin button somewhere. Yeah, we're on knee cam again. Yeah, <laughs> I do have holes in my pants here. Yeah, heating this 188 degrees, just a little bit. I'm not actually sure where the best place to heat this is. Probably down there. But anyway, if you look at these uh, now, they're pretty much the same. This one just comes in just a tiny little bit, but it was going in quite considerably before. And the other thing I did ages ago and didn't film, I replaced all four of the screws here. And these are ones for holding C64 motherboards in a brand new set. But yeah, the screws are just the right length, they look nice and tidy. Yeah, and a wee bit quiet there, but I've got that audio cable going into the TV now, which is a bit of a risk. But it's low enough level, so it's just uh, had a credit. Just make sure that it's working after the assembly. But yeah, it is sweet. Looks pretty good on that TV. Yeah, not all TVs like the almost 60 hertz signal. It's like 59.97 or something, or 59.93 get but it's not quite a 60 hertz and of course it's like that on all Neo Geos you can do a mod just by adjusting the main clock I think instead of feeding 24 megahertz and you can feed uh, something that's well it gives you an exact division down to the 60 frames per second you know, 60 hertz yeah, so it's only a short video this time. It's uh, a nice inclusion to my collection here. The, there's still a number of MVS I don't have. You know, there's uh, some of the rarer one slots. 
I don't have and there's obviously a, a number of different visions of the two slots and four slots again which I don't have that have got you know consolidation into some you know, quad flat packs and stuff because um, mine are generally the older ones apart from a two slot I think um, but anyway there's lots of Neo Geo videos on my channel so if you you know wanting to repair these and stuff and look at all the different models check out some of the other videos in the playlist I do hope you found the video interesting if you liked the video, please give it a thumbs up. It does help with uh, search uh, ratings and things like that. And I'll catch you in the next video.